so yeah, my name is Mark Sugiyama. I am uh, now a, a software engineer at uh, Datometry. Um, prior to that, I was at Erlang Solutions for uh, about three years. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, basically prototyping work that we did at Datometry uh, to um, implement a uh, server that implements the Postgres PGV3 protocol. Um, but before I get going, uh, I want to just give a little background uh, about Datometry to give you some motivation for why we did this project. Um, so Datometry, uh, our product is a database virtualization platform. So what it allows is for customers who have uh, applications that are talking to some, uh, say, legacy database system to uh, redirect their applications to a more modern database, say like a cloud-based database. Um, so the, uh, the, the product is called HyperQ, and it uh, does basically two things. It will translate the network protocols, right, because maybe you're talking some proprietary protocol to the database, so we will translate that into the network protocol of the cloud database. Uh, and then we will also um, uh, cross-compile the SQL. Uh, so SQL, every database has a, some variants in its SQL. The dialects are all different. Uh, and so, and many of the cloud databases aren't as feature rich as some of the legacy databases. So what we'll do is we will emulate missing features or, or whatnot in order to allow the applications to run without change on these new databases. Um, and our backend is written almost entirely in Erlang. There's a little bit of C code for ODBC work, but it's basically all uh, in Erlang. So basically what we want to do is build a client library that we can give to our customers uh, so that they can uh, communicate with us with our own uh, database, uh, with our own, uh, uh, in our own network protocol. Um, so this, uh, this would need to be uh, ODBC, JDBC, uh, and um, the, the sort of the input language to this from the client side has to be any kind of SQL, right? It can't just be, you know, Oracle SQL or Sybase SQL. Uh, and our back end is, like I said, is all written in Erlang. So as a way of prototyping this work, uh, we started with uh, PGV3, uh, which is the network protocol that Postgres uses. Uh, the reason we chose this is that uh, it's been in use for a long time, so it's very well seasoned. It's been the protocol itself has been debugged. Uh, it's all open source, and it's reasonably well documented. Uh, the Postgres documentation uh, includes information about what the protocol flow is and what the format of all the messages are. So we have this documentation that we can work from. And then we also have some reference implementations, right? The Postgres itself is open source. The library, the, the uh, client libraries, uh, which uh, libpq is sort of the low-level library. And then on top of that is ODBC. And then kind of separately off to the side, there's a JDBC implementation. And those are all open source. So we have these nice reference uh, implementations. Um, so the purpose of this project was to sort of better understand how the PGV3 protocol worked, um, to understand how to encode and decode the messages, and then what the flow of the protocol is. And then on a personal level, uh, I wanted to learn more about GenStatum. Uh, I had not used it before. Uh, I had done GenFSM, uh, but I had not used GenStatum. So it was also an exercise in trying to learn a little bit more about how to use GenStatum. So of curiosity, how many people have used Gen servers? Okay, what about GenFSM? Uh, fewer, okay. Gen Statum? Okay, just one, all right. So, <laughs> so okay, so maybe this is a, a good topic. And if you've got some experience with Gen FSM, you'll probably like what you see with Gen Statum. It's, it's I think, a, a better, uh, it has a better, excuse me, has a better API. Okay. So let's first talk about what the PGV3 messages look like. Um, so there's some nice things about it. Uh, it's uh, uh, in network byte order, so integers and whatnot are always in network byte order. Um, and the message format is typically a single byte, which is a tag that identifies the kind of message, followed by a 32-bit value, which is the length of the, of, the pay, of the message, which doesn't include the one byte, but does include itself. So the minimum size of a message is four. Right, and it's a five byte message. Um, then there's the actual payload of the message. So if you wanted to use uh, binary uh, pattern matching, 
you can you can match it using you know a, a, a pattern like this right where the uh, first eight bits are the type of the message then we have the 32-bit length followed by the payload right which will extract as a binary so really quick and easy uh, it's really nice unfortunately there are a couple of exceptions uh, as there are I think always in network protocols um, when the uh, when when the connection is initially made, there are a couple of requests that are sent uh, which don't follow this pattern. Uh, the first one is um, the very first message that's usually sent by the client is an SSL request, and it's basically asking the server, "Do you want to support SSL? Do you want to do this connection using SSL?" Um, and it has that uh, those those uh, five bytes that look just like that. Uh, and then afterwards, once the, there's that negotiation happens, then there's a startup message, which also does not have a tag, uh, but has it starts with a length. Uh, it has, I believe that's the version number of, uh, of the protocol uh, and then the payload uh, of the startup message. So there are a couple of exceptions. Fortunately, we know when they're going to come. They're always going to come at the beginning. So we can kind of deal with that exception fairly easily. Okay. So as far as using uh, binary pattern matching, um, there's a couple of things. So we can decode a, um, oh, all right. So, so the, the other problem that comes is that we're talking, the messages are arriving via TCP, right? So, but the TCP message boundaries may not line up with the message boundaries of the Postgres messages. Right. So we might read some information, some uh, a packet from TCP or a binary from TCP, but it's going to be too short. But you know, since since the message includes the length, we can very easily tell if we don't have enough data. Right. Uh, so it's very nice that the length comes very early uh, in the message. Um, so we can have a pattern match that looks like this with a with a guard that says, well, if we got a piece of data and we try to match it this way, and the length is too short then um, we can reply that we need more data, right? So as part of a message coalescing that could go back to the TCP handle and say, okay, hold on to buffer this. When I get the next piece, let's append them together and then try again, okay? On the other hand, the boundary might be the other way, right? Maybe the client sent us more than one message, right? So in which case we need to kind of, we need to split them up so if we have a message that's too long, like this one, we can extract just the portion that is the payload for that one message. So what we can then return to the um, uh, return is uh, something that has, uh, has the type pulled out as well as the exact payload for that message. So that'll make the parsing a lot easier because we don't have to worry about partial messages. We don't necessarily have to worry about stray bytes at the end, kind of take care of that early. Right. So that'll simplify the decoding later on. All right. So when we get into writing our message decoder, we can start to make some nice assumptions, right? We can assume that the, um, the payload is the proper length. We could make the assumption um, that the, uh, and then the payload itself, the, sh the information in it is going to depend on the message type. Um, and this is true except for uh, the responses to authentication. So unfortunately, the Postgres protocol uses the same tag for all the different uh, authentication response responses. So in other words, if you use um, plain text or LDAP lookup or you know whatever else, the amount of the data that you get back, the sort of the shape of the response or the request uh, is different, but uh, the tag is the same. So you need some context to know how to decode that message. Fortunately, you know that the client has requested a certain, or the, rather the server has requested that the client authenticate in a certain way, so you know that the thing that the client is sending you is that, should be that form, right? should match the, uh, the, the request type. Uh, but still, it makes the decoding of the messages slightly harder because you can't just have a single function that says, okay, here's, here are the bytes. Now give me all the fields for the payload for that that message type because you need the context of uh, you need the in order to do that for the authentication messages you need the context of the authentication type to do that so it gets a little bit more complicated um, then uh, but otherwise uh, you know we can just have a, a, a series of function heads to decode the different message types uh, so for example um, 
uh, C, I think, is uh, close, uh, means close, like close a cursor or a, a statement. Um, you know, it has, uh, it has uh, some information. It has, the, again, the length, uh, but then also this item count and then uh, the parameters. So, and, and there will be this many per of the parameters here. Uh, or D, which is uh, describe the parameters, uh, uh, has uh, the length and then some uh, parameter information that it wants, that the client would like to see described. So for all the message types, we can just have these function heads like this that are decoding the different fields of the payload. Um, so that's one of the real beauties of the Erlang um, binary, uh, binary pattern matching. It makes this very, very easy. Uh, there are some common patterns to the payload. Uh, so it's uh, helpful to create some utility functions uh, to deal with those patterns. Uh, one of them is, um, uh, one of the common patterns in the payloads is uh, a series of null terminated strings. So these are like C style strings with zeros that mark the end of the string. Um, so these are a little bit tricky to decode because you don't have the length ahead of time. So you don't know, like me, see how many bytes that you want to suck into the next string. Uh, so you can use, there's a built-in function, or well, there's a, a binary function, uh, which will split the binary on whatever the, this byte is, right? So we can say, or actually you can have more than one byte here, but you can, we, we can say that we want to split the binary on a zero. So what we'll get is, the first part of it will be the string, right, without the terminating zero, because that's what we need for Erlang. And then whatever else is there, right, the rest of it. Uh, and so we can do this in a, uh, with some recursion in order to um, sort of take away all of the, uh, uh, take, take the strings one by one. And then usually the way that uh, it marks the end of the list is that there'll be a, a another zero, right? So it'll be, you'll have this, the last string which terminates with a zero and then the next byte will be a zero and that would indicate that you're at the end of the list of strings. Um, so we can just pattern match on that here. Now, of course, we end up with the strings in the reverse order because we're, uh, we're, so we're at, at adding to the accumulator this way. So we have to reverse them to get them in the correct order, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Another common pattern uh, is uh, just lists of integers. Um, so here's one where we're looking at the list of 16-bit uh, 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 integers um, or two-byte integers. So those will typically have uh, a length at first, and then the uh, and then the uh, the integers themselves all packed together. And here we can use. Uh, this, uh, I don't know if you've seen this in, in using bi uh, binary pattern matching, uh, you can use uh, this unit thing. So anyone fam familiar with that? Heard that? No, okay. So in, in binary pattern, ma or in binary pattern matching, uh, the pattern, sort of the date, this is, this, is the, this is the number of things, right, after the clone. So this is where we're, the var variable we're gonna put the value in. This is the number of things that we want to pattern match out, right? And then this is identifying what those things are, okay? Um, for a binary, a thing is usually one byte long, right? So that's why in some of the other examples, um, see like, uh, no, not this one. Here, we can use the, uh, yeah, here, we can use the length here to say we want that many bytes out of the out of the buffer right okay but you can also t override that and you can say well i don't want to count bytes i want to count something else and that's where the unit comes in so here we're saying that we don't want to count bytes we want to count 16 bit values right so then the amount of data that ends up in here is going to be that many bits times that many of them, right? So that makes it really convenient to sort of unpack data in different forms, right? Because you can, you don't have to sort of do the math yourself. You can just kind of communicate that in the pattern match. And then if you can, if you understand how to read this, it's very clear what's happening, right? What we're saying is we want to extract that many 16-bit values from, from this, um, 
from this buffer. Right? It's pretty neat, right? Yeah. Um, so then we can we can do that, and then we can uh, uh, we can use uh, so this uses this little helper uh, helper function to split up that larger binary into the actual 16-bit values. Um, and here, here's this thing here that looks a little bit like, I mean, it's basically, it, it, it's, a, um, it's a list comprehension, uh, but, but this is different, right? This is not a, uh, so less than dash, it's a less than equal, right? So this means that this is a binary generator, not a, like a list generator, okay? So it will pattern match this value across this, or this pattern across this binary. And because we put brackets on the outside, where the output of this is a list. You can do this the other way around, and you could make, you could have a, if you're encoding these, you can do this the other way around, and you could have a list generator here and a binary on the outside, and then it's a binary comprehension, right? And so you iterate through the elements of the list, but you're producing a binary. Or you could do both lists or both binaries or you know, whatever you want. So that's another neat trick to, to reduce the amount of code that you need to write. Okay, any questions? All right. So just look at a slightly more complex example, uh, kind of a complete example. So there's a, one of the um, messages is bind. So uh, what that means is, so when you, um, uh, there, there, in, in the Postgres protocol, there are two different ways of executing a query. So one way is you just send it the query string, you know, select star from table one, right? And then it'll execute that and send the response back. The other way you can do it is called, I think, the extended query mode, where you, you do it in three steps. The first step is you send it the query, and the query might have fill-ins for parameters. So uh, in, in most SQLs, it's put in as a question mark. So you might say select, uh, select A from a table where column B equals question mark, right? So that's the parameter is the question mark. Uh, Postgres is a little bit different. It uses, it actually numbers them, so it'll be $1, $2, $3, but it's basically the same idea. Um, so that's how you send the query. Then you send a bind, which says, which, uh, which assigns values to those parameters. And then you send an execute to actually execute the query, right? Um, so this is the bind step. So these, this is the request that the client would send to the server to say, okay, here are the values for the parameters. Um, so there's the one byte, uh, the type, the message length, which is common to all message types. Uh, and then there's a string, which is the portal name, and then a string, which, which is kind of like the cursor, uh, and a string, which is the prepared statement name, and that's you know, when we sent it the statement, we can give it a name so we can refer to it again later. Uh, then we say there's a, a, an int 16, which is the count of the, of the uh, parameter formats and a list of those formats. We, already, we just saw how we could decode that. And then for each of the parameters, there is a 32-bit a value, uh, which is the length of the parameter value, and then the actual bytes of that parameter. Um, uh, and then following that <laughs> is uh, another list of 16-bit integers, which is um, the format codes. Uh, in Postgres, there are two. You can either send the data as text or you can send it as a, in the binary format. Okay. So the decode takes advantage of some of those uh, utility functions that, we looked, that, that I, looked, we, I showed earlier. So we can uh, take these, we, we have the payload, which was decoded, f you know, extracted for us before, right? Uh, and we know it's complete and we know that it's the right length. And then we can um, uh, take the uh, uh, the payload. The I'm sorry. Take the portal string. Pay, take the prepared statement string out. Then we can extract uh, the um, the number of the format count and the this list here of all the formats. Uh, and then there's the value count. And then the remainder here. We can then take uh, format B. Oh, I probably. Where did format B go? I think, oh yeah, here it is. So format B, right, to extract the 16-bit values. Um, 
then there's this other utility function, which I don't think I included, which kind of deals with this more complex structure of the length followed by the bytes of the length, uh, uh, the bytes of the parameters, uh, but it, it follows very much the same pattern as some of these other things. Um, and then again, again, take, use that take 16 int uh, helper function to deal with the, uh, uh, the format list, right? So we've taken that, we've taken this fairly complex uh, um, message and decoded it in just a few lines of code, right? And then return a tuple so that it's much easier to deal with at, at you know, at the next, in the next step of processing, right? So I think it just, what I'm trying to demonstrate is how powerful pattern match or binary pattern matching can be to decode these messages, right? Even if they weren't really designed to be Erlang friendly, um, uh, we can, we can still do these things, right? And it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, and um, it's pretty clear, once you can read it, it's pretty clear what's happening, right? So it's easy to, to think about. All right. Um, right, so I, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are some ambiguous messages uh, with the, um, the uh, authentication, and uh, we kind of deal with that by knowing where we are in the handshake. Uh, we know how to decode the messages because we know that we are at a particular stage of the handshake. So we can kind of deal with this by um, decoding the messages not in sort of this message decoding part, but what, by the time we get to the protocol handler, because the protocol handler is the only thing that knows what stage of the handshake we're in, right? So we have to wait until we're there in order to fully decode the message. Yeah. And we'll talk about that. We'll kind of get there. We're getting, we're getting there, working our way up. Um, so that's, so we've talked about how to deal with the uh, decoding the messages. Obviously, we have to send responses back, right? Um, the uh, responses in PGV3 look pretty much like the requests. There is a, um, there's a 8-bit type, uh, the length, and then the payload, where the length, again, is the length including itself, right? So the payload will always be four bytes shorter than the length. Um, and for dealing with um, fixed length messages, it's pretty easy because you can just hard code the length, right? And there are plenty of fixed length messages in this protocol, like for uh, responding uh, that you've, you know, uh, that a command is complete or something. There, a lot of these are fixed length. Um, maybe that one isn't, but there are, there are lots of fixed length responses. So you can just sort of hard code all the bits um, for that. There are messages that are variable length, like if you're returning row data, right? You don't know ahead of time how many columns are going to be or what the actual data will be. Uh, you do need to then compute the length. Uh, so I, had, I created a little helper function called set length, where I type in, uh, pass it the type and the payload, and then it computes the length and then constructs the, um, the message here. Uh, one of the issues with this, though, is that um, it could involve um, uh, a mem copy, right? So remember that the semantics of binaries in Erlang is that they are a contiguous chunk of memory, right? So if you are appending, continually appending to the end of a binary, it's going to have to copy that binary in order to fit it into a bigger buffer, right? Now, it, there are some heuristics that it uses, so it always allocates a little bit of extra space at the end of a binary. I don't remember, it's like 16 bytes or something like that, I don't know. Um, so that you can add a little bit to it, but at some point it's gonna say, well, it's out of space, so it's gonna allocate a bigger buffer and then do a mem copy to copy the, um, copy the data. So you can avoid that by using IO lists, right? So rather than actually constructing the binary, you construct a list of the binaries. And most of the uh, functions that you would probably call after that will, will take a binary, a, a list of binaries, an IO list instead of a complete binary. Like for example, you can write it to the network as, a, as an IO list. Um, the one thing that you can't do is if you need to then later process it somehow, like scan it for something uh, or compute its length, that's a little bit, you, have, you, you can't call size because you'll get the size of the list, not the size of the, the binary. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, but, but in general, yeah, it, it's worth thinking a little bit about are, are you going to cause there to be a mem copy? Right, particularly if you're in a path where you want to have very high performance. Uh, I do remember I had a friend that was working for a uh, company that built backup servers. This was when people were backing things up to tape. 
and uh, he said they lost a bid because they had one more mem copy than their competitor. Right? So sometimes this has a big impact. Right. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so one thing I didn't met talk about too much is um, where this data comes from. Uh, so um, the way that I structured the prototype is uh, I made a gen statum, which was the connection handler. Uh, so the connection handler uh, is the thing that would take the listener socket, uh, wait for a connection to arrive in the accept, uh, and then had the handle info in it for the TCP messages uh, that would be arriving from the client. Um, and then it was responsible for, the connection handler is responsible for coalescing the TCP messages into complete PGV3 messages. It was also responsible for splitting them up uh, if it more than one arrived uh, at once. Uh, and then it would take these messages that it decoded and then hand them one by one to the protocol handler, which was a separate uh, uh, gen statum. Uh, I initially tried to make them the same gen statum, uh, but it turns out to be kind of complicated, uh, in particular because of the message. If, if they didn't have to do message coalescing, it'd be fine. But because you have to do the message coalescing and the message splitting, it, it got more complicated because you had to remember, well, I am in a state where I have an incomplete message, or I'm in a state where I have more than one message, and you have to hold on to them somewhere. And so it's just much easier to just have two different processes and, and have the message passing. It was just much easier to implement. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a handshake with the PGV3 protocol. So now we're kind of moving from we have the messages to what do the messages actually mean, right? What is the, what is the, the language here? Um, so here's two different ways of looking at it. So here we have... Um, a, a sequence diagram, and I don't know if you've used uh, web sequence diagrams. Has anyone else used that? Yeah, it's a really good tool, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's a tool, it's a, it's a website you can go to, you can use it for, there's a premium version, but you can also use it for free, and you can type in um, a, a textual description of the flow uh, of a sequence diagram uh, in a very simple language, and then it draws you a picture and then you can just uh, save the URL to that picture uh, to be able to edit it later or just get the image, right? Uh, and um, uh, it's great. It's a great way to, um, it, it's just a really fast way of building these things. Um, so if you haven't tried it, give it a, give it a try. Um, so anyway, so here, here's the, the protocol. So we have the client and we have our server. And uh, the, like I said, the first thing that happens is that the client will send a SSL request, it'll connect, send the uh, SSL request, and then the server can s respond with yes or no about uh, SSL support. Just to keep it simple, I said no. Uh, and then the next thing that comes is the startup messages. And those are the two messages that don't have the same shape, right? They don't have the type on them. But they also only occur right at the beginning, so we can kind of special case that. Um, then the server responds with a authentication um, style. How, how should the client authenticate? Um, because of the nature of our product, we always uh, we use uh, clear text because we rely on the sort of the target database to handle the authentication. Uh, so we have to know what the password is in order to pass it all the way through to the to the target database. Um, and then the uh, the client responds with a uh, uh, basically, it's an authentication response, but that res and this is again that one that's ambiguous. But we know that the payload is a password because we asked for a password, right? As opposed to asking for LDAP credentials or something else. Um, and then the the server will send a "I'm ready for a query," a "ready for query" message. At that point, the client can start sending us messages. So in this in this example, it just sends us it sends the simple query. Uh, which is just the text of the query. And then the server responds with uh, three things. It will respond with uh, a description of the result. So what are the columns in the result, the types of the columns of the result. The actual data, and there might be one or more rows of data, might be zero rows of data, I guess. Uh, and then finally, that uh, it's done sending the responses. Right? And then it says, okay, now I'm ready for the next query. Right. So the one request ends up sending these four messages back. Um, 
so that's, this is one way. The other way of looking at it is as sort of a state diagram where we say, well, we have this start state. We eventually get through authentication OK, right? That's kind of the stage here. There's this, uh, which then puts us into a ready for query state. We get the query. Uh, we send, as the protocol handler, we send the query to the database. The database does its thing, sends us the data back, and then we respond back to the client, finally sending the command complete. And, when, and then when we send the command complete, we're back in the ready for query state. Right? So we can, we can view this protocol also as a state diagram. Right? And I kind of left out these things where we're sending the messages that don't, don't change our state because I didn't want to clutter the graph up too much. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So this, the combination of these things, is what we need in order to create the gen statum to represent the protocol. Right? We have to understand what are all the events, what are the messages that are going to be coming in from the client that will that, affect our state. And we have to understand what those states are that we may need to transition to. Right? And the thing that kind of distinguishes, in my mind, the different states are what are the valid messages that we're going to receive in those states or send in those states. Okay. So because we're only expecting certain messages when we're in the start state, we're only expecting certain messages when we're, we're in the ready for query state. Like if we're in the ready for query state and we get a startup message, there's something wrong, right? And we should be able to detect that, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So what is gen statum? Uh, so gen statum is, is a OTP behavior, uh, and it's for uh, implementing finite state machines. So it's, it, in a sense, replaces, well, it does, it's not in a sense, it replaces GenFSM. GenFSM is being deprecated. Um, and in fact, I don't know if you've looked at the documentation in Erlang 20, it's not even documented anymore. There's this, like, this one page that says, here's an example, and that's all it's got. Um, so uh, if you're going to do these things, do you need to, to do you have to now use gen statum or at least you know if you want to actually understand what you're doing by reading documentation um, and uh, I'm going to just early on establish some uh, terminology um, it's always confusing in Erlang to talk about state machines because you know when we do gen servers we have this extra variable that we call the state which is really the loop data Right, the other way to think about it. So what I'm going to and and when we talk about a state machine, there is also the state of the machine, like it's in the ready for query state, which is different from the loop data, right? So let's be just for clarity. When I say state, I'm referring to the state of the state machine, like ready for query. When I say data, I'm talking about state in the gen server sense. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Because I remember the first time I was reading the documentation about GenFSM, it was extraordinarily confusing uh, because I kept reading state as state like the gen server sense. And of course, that's not what it meant at all. Um, so anyway. Um, so uh, gen statum, I guess, ended up being kind of a compromise. It, it has two modes that it can operate in. In one mode, uh, which is called state functions, uh, it, in that mode, it operates something like GenFSM. Um, where the states are callback functions. So in that mode, ready for query would be a callback function that would represent that state. Okay. Um, so that's like the GenFSM model. Uh, the other model is called handle event function. And in the handle event function model, there is a single callback function called handle event uh, which uh, is used for all the states. So one of its arguments is the uh, is the current state of the GenFSM or of the GenStatum. Um, this is a little bit like the GenFSM's all state event functions. Okay. Um, so made a little made a little chart here to describe the differences, which I won't go over, but it's in the presentation. So if you've done some GenFSM work and you're trying to understand how you would use GenStatum, there's a little map that might, might help you with that. Okay. So, but I think the thing to point out here is how the handle events work, right? So if you're using a GenStatum, um, the handle event mechanism, uh, uh, the first argument is going to be uh, how the client sent the message, basically. 
right? So did it send it as a cast? Is it a call or is it an Erlang message, right? So you have cast, you have the Erlang message, it says info, and then for um, calls, it's a tuple that gives you, that says it's a call, and then there's the from thing for the replies, right, if you have the delayed reply. Uh, then there's the, the actual event, there's the state, and then there's the loop data. Okay. So what's nice about this interface is that it's, it, you, you have this sort of common callback function that handles everything, right? You no longer have the ARD3 ones for cast and the, or ARD2 ones, no, three ones for cast and the ARD4 ones for, um, for calls and you don't have the separate handle info and you don't have the all state handle something, you know, it, it's all, it, I, I think this, this interface is much, much clearer, right? Because you can put all of the code that relates to a particular state in one place, right? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's much, much better. All right, any questions? Okay, so here is just uh, an example. Uh, so we've got the handle event. The first argument is the event type, which I said was the, the call, the cast, uh, call, cast, or info. The actual event, which was the message, uh, what the state of the gen statum is, and then the loop data. Okay. Uh, so with this mechanism, there's no separate handle all state event because you don't need it, right? All you do is you just don't pattern match on the state. Or maybe you do pattern match on the state because it's only applicable to three of the 12 states in your system, right? So you can just do that pattern match right here. Um, so again, I think it's, it's, it's a really nice way. Um, if you use the other way with the, um, the uh, state functions way, uh, they've, uh, GenStatum does not have an all state event mechanism. So you have to add code to each of the state functions to handle all state events, uh, which is a bit of a pain, so. Um, okay, all right, uh, okay, so here's just a, a, a pared down example of the, uh, of the code for, for handling the, just the, uh, the query portion of the, of the, of the uh, protocol. Uh, so we're, we're in this state, we're, right? So we're in this ready for query state. So we'll get, um, we'll send to the client the ready for query. <coughs> we will, the client will send us a query which will get decoded and then we'll end up with uh, the type which is query and we're in the ready for query state and then we transition, we, we send that off to the server that's gonna handle it, transition to the wait for result state, so now we're waiting for the server to send us, you know, our, our database to send us something back and then once we get something back then we can start sending the responses back to the, the client. So we can, while we're in our wait for result set, we can uh, uh, maybe, if this is the back end, maybe also understands our protocol, so it will send us a row description, which we will send back to the client. It will send us the row data, which we'll send back to the client. And then it'll send us the command complete, right? Um, when we see the command complete, we know that we need to go back to the ready for query state. So we transition, uh, we transition back to the uh, ready for query state. Uh, and just like with GenFSMs uh, and, and uh, Gen Servers, uh, you know, we, the returns from these call, from the handle event callback function just says, you know, what to do, right? So it'll say, um, uh, it'll say the next state should be, you know, some, some state, right? So this is a, um, a little snippet out of the, out of the prototype that I wrote where, uh, <coughs> The messages are always cast in. Uh, the message is the query with the, the query type with the actual query. When we're in the ready for query state, there's our loop data. And then I call the backend server to do something. And then I wait, oops, sorry. I wait for the, um, I go into a different state here, the simple reply until complete state. This is basically the waiting for data state, right? Um, then, we get the, uh, the we get the row description back from the backend server. Uh, we send that off to the client, and, but we stay in that same state because we haven't seen the uh, command complete message yet from the server. Uh, we get the row data, which we need to do some formatting on. So that's what all of this is doing. Um, yeah, so we're still in the wait for basically the wait for data wait for um, 
uh, reply state, wait for data state. Uh, we, we format the data rows, send those back to the client, and then eventually we get a, uh, a completion message saying, okay, server's done, so we're, and we're in the, simple, uh, the wait for data state, so we respond with the command complete, and then we go back into the ready for query state, All right? So that's pretty good. Now, one other thing is that now we need to send to the client the ready for query message, right? But basically, we need to do that every time we enter the ready for query state, right? So um, in our code, depending on how many states there are, there might be lots of places where we need, we're going to transition back to that state. So GenStatum offers this nice capability where you can have, oh, keep wanting to click on it to highlight it. OK. Um, OK, yeah, we're almost done. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we, we have this, you have this uh, event type, which is enter, which allows you to, which tells GenFSM, uh, GenStatum that every time you enter the state, here's some code to execute, right? So we're going to enter the ready for query state. So that means, oh, we should write out, send the ready for query message back to the client, right? And we don't have to do that anywhere else in our code, which is really nice. Okay. Um, so we have uh, just a little summary here. Basically, the messages are like the vocabulary of the protocol. Uh, the protocol is like the, the, the handshake is like the grammar, right, of a language. And uh, basically try to separate the two of them. So the connection handler dealt with decoding the messages, and the protocol handler keeps track of the language, right, the, 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 the handshake, right? And that separation uh, worked really well for me. Uh, it made it uh, much easier to implement. Uh, we have uh, one of the uh, challenges, some of the challenges that emerged is that uh, some uh, PostgreSQL kind of leaks into the uh, PGV3 implementation of ODBC, JDBC, and um, PQLib, uh, where things like uh, metadata lookup, so there are calls in ODBC to say, what are all the tables? What are the columns on this table? And those turn into queries against the Postgres. Uh, system catalogs, right, which is, wouldn't, doesn't work for us. Um, so we have, to, we have to make some changes to the ODBC, JDBC code for that. Um, there are some other things like it, uh, the, uh, they send information to the server to find out what the uh, session settings are to set session variables. Uh, and then, again, the parameterized queries are transformed. The question marks are turned into dollars, dollar one, dollar two. So we have to kind of take, some, uh, take care of that too. Uh, some lessons that uh, learned. Um, about this, uh, if you ever decide, if you ever have the opportunity to implement your own network protocol, um, uh, ambiguous message tags are really a pain in the neck, uh, as are inconsistent message tags, um, in the sense that uh, uh, the um, the requests and the responses have different message tags. Right, it makes it a little bit harder to debug. Um, fields for if, if you're decoding with Erlang, uh, it's uh, fields with unspecified length are kind of a pain because you, you have to actually scan it to find it. And if you have a list of them, then you end up constructing the list backwards and you know it's a little bit of extra code. So it's nice if you know the list length ahead of time. Um, like I said, it was a little bit hard when I tried to put the connection handler and the protocol handler in the same uh, gen statum. Um, you have to deal with message chunking. Uh, I am told that uh, particularly in cloud environments, uh, the TCP packet sometimes gets split up, broken up into pieces. Uh, so this is an important thing to worry about. Uh, and I'm gonna, not going to talk about the last thing because I'm out, running out of time. But basically, um, we run into performance issues, network performance issues, uh, because uh, some of the protocols we work with have synchronous acknowledgments. Uh, and so the issue there is with uh, having a lot of bandwidth but a lot of latency. Right? And we can talk about that after. Thank you. Uh, if you want to learn more about Datometry, uh, we're at datometry.com, and we are hiring uh, Erlang people. So any, if you know anyone that wants a job in sort of the database area uh, or just do Erlang, uh, let us know. Thank, Thank you. Mark.